Last year, we kicked off the series premiere of Record West Virginia with a look into the Battle of Mate One. This season, we start with what can be considered a continuation of the story, as we explore the culmination of the Cold Wars and the Battle of Blair Mountain 100 years later. After the defeat of the Baldwin Fells Detective Agents at the Battle of Mate One in the spring of 1920, miners across the coal fields of West Virginia, emboldened by victory, were finally ready to make a stand. Siat Hatfield, who had become a folk hero in the region, led the charge, rallying miners to join the United Mine Workers of America and to fight back against the oppression of the coal companies and the operators. As the Union gained strength, the coal companies looked to try and regain control, and sporadic shootouts up and down the Tug River became a somewhat common occurrence. Tensions were still rising in early 1921, when Hatfield's trial for his role in the Battle of Matewan got underway. The trial was national news, further raising the profile of Sid Hatfield and brought attention and awareness to the cause of the coal miners. Hatfield would be acquitted of all charges, but the tides were turning against Sid and his coal mining friends as the coal companies began using newly imported workers and yellow dog contracts to return the mines to productivity. Unionized miners lost their jobs and their homes, forcing many into makeshift tent colonies. Eventually, in May of 1921, these miners in Mingo County would launch a full-scale attack on the coal companies in what would become known as the Three Days Battle. So you, you can't really understand the mine war story unless you understand the context. The world for 10,000 years had been an agrarian society. Everybody survived by small farms raising their food. There were a few blacksmiths or store owners, but 99% of the people survived by raising their own food. And then the Industrial Revolution comes along, and in a very short period, in America, in about 30 years, it completely changes all that and people go from working on farms for themselves to moving to cities and working in factories and working for somebody else. And it was an upheaval in social norms and economics and everything else. It changed the world. Anytime you have th these kind of large upheavals, it takes a while for the rules to catch up. And so what began to happen is, is that these workers were paid these extremely low wages. Most of them couldn't live. A lot of them, they would work, their wife would take in washing, their kids would work, and they still could not afford to keep a roof over their head. And they became very frustrated with that, and they wanted to find a way to have some power. And what they fell upon was the thing called a labor union. And it was a way for the miners to basically bargain as one person. And it began to have some success around the country. In different parts of the country, it began to take hold. But it also resulted in these enormous strikes and these very, very violent confrontations. A lot of unionizing activities were branded as communist activities because labor unions came out of communist thinking. And you had the overthrow of the government in Russia by communism. And what a lot of these coal companies would do was they would sell any kind of union activity as communism because they didn't want to lose power. They didn't want these people to be able to bargain collectively. So they would brand them as communism to basically get people to turn against them. The civil rights of people were violated. The government was so worried about these uprisings that your right to freedom of assembly was suspended. You couldn't have more than two people talk on the street. If three people were having a conversation on the street, you could be arrested. You could not speak your mind. Your freedom of speech was canceled. You couldn't talk anything about the unions. Mother Jones, who was the most famous la labor organizer uh, in, in that period, she was actually given a 20-year prison sentence for reading the Declaration of Independence in public. On August 1st, 1921, just a few months after Mingo County had been placed under martial law, Sid Hatfield, along with his deputy and friend Ed Chambers, would travel to McDowell County, where Sid was to stay in trial 
for allegedly dynamiting a coal tipple. It's here, on the courthouse steps, that the members of the Baldwin Fells Detective Agency would enact their revenge, opening fire on the unsuspecting men, killing both Hatfield and Chambers in cold blood. Word of Hatfield's assassination traveled throughout the mountains, whipping the miners into a frenzy. On August 7th, UMWA leaders held a rally in Charleston at the state capitol and petitioned Ephraim Morgan with a list of demands, which the governor flatly rejected. Further enraged, the miners, many of whom were armed, gathered in Kanawha County on the 20th of August with plans to march to Mingo to free confined miners, end martial law, and unionize the county. However, Logan County Sheriff Don Chafin and a force of more than 2,000 men backed by the Logan County Coal Operators Association, stood in the way. And so the word gets out about this. Sid Hatfield has become a hero throughout the country in this intervening time. And when he is murdered in cold blood in broad daylight in this fashion, it infuriates coal miners and other workers throughout the country. And they start amassing and marching to West Virginia. And these miners want to get retribution for Sid Hatfield, but they also want to figure out what's going on down here that you could murder a, a police official in broad daylight and get away with it. And eventually, thousands, some reports 10,000, some reports 15,000 men gathered just outside Charleston and Marmette. And the area was, was very, very rugged, and they couldn't ride the trains because the, the train companies worked with the coal companies, and the train was the only way to get here. And so they couldn't ride the train. So they began to march and got to the area of Logan. And when the reports came that this minor army was coming down, you got to realize this is in the time when there were these big uprisings and anarchists. People thought they were going to overthrow the government. The Bolshevik Revolution had happened not too long ago in Russia, and people were terrified that communist forces were coming in and going to overthrow America. And so this was a terrifying event that these armed men, most of them were World War I veterans, were coming in. Blair Mountain, on the border between Boone and Logan counties, rises 1,952 feet. And on August 25, 1921, an anti-Union force heavily equipped with machine gun turrets, was entrenched on the mountain's steep terrain. Marching toward them were 10,000 incensed unionized coal miners, armed with hunting rifles and red bandanas tied around their necks to help distinguish friend from foe. It was on this day that the first shots of the battle were fired, and it seemed as if the battle would come to a quick close. President Warren Harding threatened to send in federal troops including some army bombers to quell the uprising, and the miners were convinced to return to their homes the next day. But as the miners started their trek home, Sheriff Don Chafin, who wanted to permanently end any attempt to unionize Logan and Mingo counties, decided to fire on a group of unionized sympathizers in the nearby town of Sharples. The miners turned around and began the march back up Blair Mountain. If it was a fight Chafin wanted, then the miners were going to be more than happy to give him one. The two sides spent the next several days locked into a bloody and ruthless battle. The miners had the numbers, but Chafin and his men had the superior firepower. So one of the little side stories of this is that the miners needed a way to differentiate themselves from the enemy. A lot of them were in their World War I uniforms, but a lot of them were just dressed as miners. And so they hit upon an idea that had been used previously that the miners would take these red handkerchiefs and tie them around their neck. And so that way they could tell friend from foe. And so they began to be called rednecks as a part of that. And there were reports that were sent to the governor and to the president, this redneck army is coming trying to overthrow us. And so this is when the term redneck became popularized. Now, the sheriff of Logan County was a guy named Don Chafin. Don Chafin was a famed leg breaker. Anybody who came in to his town, he had deputies on the uh, platform to talk to them when they got off the train. And if they didn't recognize them, they would ask them who they were or what their business was because they didn't want any unionizers to come there. And if they were a unionizer, they usually either ended up in a ditch or never were seen again. So Don Chafin is the sheriff, but he is paid the equivalent in today's dollars 
$300,000 a year by the coal companies. And so Don Chafin began scrambling around and trying to gather an army, and he got about 2,500 men. And they, they went to the top of a mountain called Blair Mountain, which is right on the Logan Boone County line, and got the high ground. And they had machine guns. Now you gotta remember, machine guns were just invented in World War I, so it's brand new technology. Here's a machine gun that can kill 100 men in a minute. So it was terrifying. They also had these Tommy guns, so they had this really advanced weaponry that these men were gonna come and, and face. Not only did the anti-Union forces possess machine gun turrets, but they even had secured the use of private planes to drop homemade bombs on their foes in the Red Bandanas. On August 30th, Governor Morgan sent the West Virginia National Guard to reinforce Chafin and his men. Still, the determined miners used their sheer numbers to continue making headway, nearly breaking through Chafin's defenses. On September 2nd, President Harding's federal troops would finally arrive. The miners, many of whom were veterans of World War I, refused to fire upon soldiers of the United States. So they laid down their arms and began to return home. The physical battle of Blair Mountain was over, but the legal battle had just begun, as 985 miners would be indicted on charges of murder, conspiracy, and treason. The word got to a guy named Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell is the father of the American Air Force, and he wanted to be able to prove that you could use planes to fight against ground troops. So first flight, 1903. This is 1921. So you see how new planes are, brand new cutting edge technology. And so he brought the planes into Charleston to be able to use them against the coal miners. They were going to drop tear gas, and if the miners didn't go back, they were going to drop bombs and munitions on them. The day this was supposed to happen, the planes got fogged in. But Don Chafin was able to get local planes and homemade bombs that they dropped on the miners. There was one of the men there who said he was in the Spanish-American War, and he said he heard more shooting on Blair Mountain, so it was a huge conflict. Now, while all this was going on, the president finally decided he was going to act, and he got a gentleman named General Bandholz, who brought 2,500 troops in, and they did a pincer movement. They brought half of them behind the, the miners and half of them behind Don Chapin and his men. And most of the people on both sides of this had fought in World War I, and they were not willing to fire on the, the uniform that they served in. And so when the U.S. military surrounded them, they laid down their weapons. But what happened is that the government charged all the leaders of the Miners' Revolt with treason. And uh, in Charlestown, West Virginia, they had this big trial, uh, which is the same place where John Brown was, was tried. And they had this big trial for treason for all these miners who just wanted a better life. They wanted a better working condition. They wanted a minimum wage. And they were all found not guilty. And that became basically the end of the mine work. All those men in the Battle of Blair Mountain were fighting for things that we take for granted today. You know, a 40-hour work week, child labor laws, health benefits, overtime pay, safety regulations. And they died for that. They were willing to die for that. They enjoined in this massive battle, the largest battle on American soil since the Civil War, in order to try to win those things. And so it's an underknown story but it is one of the biggest turning points in America for the rights of workers and the improvement of everyday people's lives. The miners were a diverse force, made up of poor whites, newly immigrated Europeans, and about 30% of the redneck army were African American, all brought together by the oppressive circumstances of the coal mines. It was the largest labor uprising in American history and the largest armed uprising outside of the American Civil War. The Battle of Blair Mountain would serve as an eye-opener to the harsh conditions that the coal miners and other laborers suffered in. Eventually, it would lead to improved working conditions, wages, and the treatment of American workers.